welcome back to the 8-bit guy. In the past, I've done reviews of the C64 Mini and the full-size version. And today, I'm going to review the A500 Mini, which is uh, made by the same company. Of course, this product is focused on the Amiga instead of the Commodore 8-bit systems. The box is pretty high quality, and uh, on the back it shows all of the built-in games, and we'll talk more about that later. And for some reason I was sent this spiral-bound manual, I don't think this is included in the regular box, but it was nice of them to send it to me. Anyway, uh, let's get to unboxing this thing. And well, there it is. If that isn't the cutest thing I've ever seen, I don't know what is. Uh, now, for all those that are going to ask, no, the keyboard doesn't work, it's just cosmetic. But uh, the attention to detail here is really impressive. Uh, they've captured every line and detail of the Amiga 500 case, which, by the way, I think is one of the most beautiful products Commodore ever made. Of course, the rear ports look different, which is unavoidable. It almost looks like you could put a tiny disc in the drive here, but you can't. Oh, and uh, look at that. I have serial number 8. I think Parafractic has serial number 1. I wonder who has 2 through 7. So let's compare this to the real thing so you can see exactly what the size difference is. You know, even if the keys did work, you'd have to use like a pencil or something to type on it. <laughs> My finger is larger than most of these keys. So I was looking at this logo here that they're using, and I noticed uh, it's also here on the manual. And I was trying to figure out you know what that logo is i know they're not allowed to use the commodore or amiga logos because that's owned by some other company these days and i know they say they have a cloanto on here which uh, they own the roms so that makes sense um for that but yeah so what's this logo well i have a theory where they got this so there was this demo that Commodore used at CES in 1984 with this bouncing ball to show off the Amiga prototype. Now most people refer to it as the Boing Ball. This was originally intended to be the official logo for the Amiga before Commodore decided to go with the colored check mark. However, uh, this ball has always been associated with the Amiga. So I think what they've done here is taken the ball and then cut a small portion of it out like so and then inverted the colors. And so yeah, here it is. I think that's uh, I think that's what we're looking at, and that explains the entire red color scheme of this product, which uh, I think is pretty cool because that uh, gives some heritage to the uh, to the Amiga uh, logos and stuff without actually using the Amiga logos. Anyway, uh, let's finish unboxing this. So this box must have a controller, and I'm guessing this is the mouse. Look at that! It looks exactly like the original Commodore Tank mouse. Of course, this one is optical, uh, no surprises there, uh, although it does seem to be maybe a bit smaller than the original, so uh, let's compare. Yep, the original mouse is just a bit larger. And here we have some various cables, and of course, the controller. Now, this thing feels nice and solid. Now, what I mean is, it doesn't feel like a $2 Chinese knockoff controller that you'll find on eBay or something. Uh, this thing feels well-made and uh, is surprisingly heavy, and I mean that in a good way. Okay, uh, let's get this thing hooked up to a TV. Now, by the time it's all plugged in, you'll have at least four wires. There's a controller, a mouse, an HDMI cable, and a power cable, which leaves one port open for a USB flash drive, which we'll try out later. Now I'll press the power button, and oh look, uh, even the little power LED lights up. You can't see it really great on camera, but uh, if I turn the light out, you can see it. And uh, so here we are at the language selection screen. Now it looks like Amiga Workbench, but the mouse doesn't actually do anything at this point. Uh, but that's fine, you can use the controller. I'll pick 60 hertz since I'm in the USA, and um, so here we are at the main menu. So let's talk about these included games for a moment. Now I've gotten some criticism in the past when reviewing the C64 Mini when I talked about the included games and which ones I was familiar with and whether I thought it was a good selection. Of course, it was pointed out to me that many of the games that were popular in the USA were not popular in Europe and vice versa. And so um, keep in mind that I only had an Amiga for about a year during my teenage years. So my experience is more limited than, for example, with the 8-bit systems. That being said, here's a list of the games that are included on the device from the factory. So I thought we'd first just have a look at what games I actually had as a teenager. I did have Another World, that was one of my favorites. I also had Battle Chess, even though I was never any good at it. I had F-16 Combat Pilot. I had Pinball Dreams, another one of my favorites. And last, Stunt Car Racer. So uh, there we go, not many. But what about games I at least knew of from the time? Well, I knew of California games. I had that on my C64, but I was never a big fan, probably why I didn't get it on the Amiga. And likewise, I knew of Paradroid from the C64. 
Okay, well, what about games I've learned about later in my adult life? Okay, so uh, I know about the Alien Breed games, uh, Supercars 2, Worms, and Zool. So that's 12 games that I'm personally familiar with, and that's about half of them. So it's not bad, but I suppose I'm disappointed that it doesn't include Lemmings. Uh, maybe it's just me, but I feel like that was the killer app, so to speak, for the Amiga. So let's try a few games out. Um, I'll start with what I know, which is Pinball Dreams. I was disappointed that the title sequence was missing because I really loved the music for that. But uh, anyway, here's the game. Then it plays just like you'd expect, so uh, moving along, uh, let's try another world. Uh, now here they did include the title sequence, which makes me very happy. Um, it goes on for several minutes, so I won't show it all. Um, you know, I used to play this game a lot back in the day, but I never did win it. Okay, uh, let's try Zool. Now, I have to admit, I've never actually played this before. I must say it is quite colorful. In fact, the high contrast is just a little bit distracting. Anyway, moving along, I wanted to find something that worked with the mouse. So I tried Battle Chess, and it works with the mouse just like you'd expect. So uh, not a lot to comment on there. Of course, what games it comes with from the factory probably doesn't even matter to most of my audience, and that's because like previous devices, they've made this one very easy to install your own games. Um, just stick in a USB stick in the extra USB slot, and uh, then you keep scrolling through the list of games and you'll find the USB option. And as you can see, I've added a few games here, and um, one of the things you can do is configure the behavior of this game on screen. Uh, in this case, uh, you can see I've already configured the size and placement of the game on the screen, and I've told it it's an NTSC game. You can also pick what sort of controller is in each slot, and you can even configure what each button on the gamepad does for a specific game, which is very handy. And so, here's Lemmings. Uh, you get the full intro and everything. Uh, you know, I first played Lemmings on a friend's MS-DOS computer, and then I later got it for Amiga and found that it had this cool intro that the DOS version lacked for some reason. And here it is. Of course, I'm using the included mouse for this. I think this may possibly be the only commercial product of this nature that's capable of playing Lemmings with a mouse. I'm sure you could rig up a Raspberry Pi or something, but you know what I mean. Uh, by the way, I just <laughs> I love the sound that the Lemmings make on the Amiga version when they fall to their death. <laughs> Sometimes I just have to let a few fall just to hear that sound. And here's another iconic game I placed on the USB drive. Um, of course, it seems to be running at PAL speed, so the music is slower than I'm accustomed to, but probably the correct speed for at least half of the players of this out there. And of course, I have to try out Petsky Robots. Now, um, what you're gonna wanna do with this game is configure port number two as a CD32 pad. Um, this is a more advanced controller that Commodore shipped uh, with the CD32, but some Amiga games support it as well, and we decided to support it here in the game because we needed the extra buttons. Of course, once you start the game, you'll need to go in the menu here under controls and switch it to CD32 pad. Now at this point, the game plays exactly like you'd expect, um, although there are two things I should tell you about. If you compare the layout of the A500 controller to a CD32 pad, it's clearly very similar, except that it has this one extra button. Now intuitively, you'd think that this button here would be the button you'd use. However, this button is dedicated to bringing you back to the home screen of the console. In fact, as you can see on the programming screen, you aren't even allowed to modify the behavior of this one button, uh, which means if you need to use this button here on the CD32 controller, it actually maps over here to the menu button, which is a little inconvenient, uh, mainly because if you keep your left thumb on the D-pad, then you have to stretch your right thumb uh, a bit far to press this button. It's not the end of the world, though. I should also tell you about something that is not in the Petsky Robots manual. Um, as you can see, I did label all the buttons on the controller of, as what they do, but uh, I left a few things off because I figured you could still use the keyboard for things like bringing up the map or toggling the music or exiting the game back to the menu. But these features are available on the controller, they're just undocumented, so uh, let me show you how those work. If you press menu and left, it will bring up the map, and to toggle the robots on the map, use menu and down. To toggle the music, it's menu A, and to exit the game, it's menu B. Uh, so this game is completely playable without the keyboard, and I'm thrilled to see it working on this little console. Oh, and by the way, I wanted to see if this mouse would work on a regular Windows PC. 
Well, sure enough, it does. In fact, it's a pretty nice mouse to use. I can see myself using this as a daily driver if it weren't for the fact that I'm spoiled with a scroll wheel. Uh, likewise, I wanted to try the controller, and uh, sure enough, it works great as a standard controller on most everything I tried, and it even has enough buttons to play Super Nintendo games as well. So, are we going to take this one apart? <laughs> you bet we are. Uh, so, uh, there's one screw here, but I suspect there are more hiding under these rubber feet, and sure enough, there they are. So, I think I'm ready to pull it apart, but it doesn't seem to want to come apart in the front. And I have a suspicion they've also hidden a screw under the label here. I hate to mess this label up, but I guess um, I guess I'll mess mine up so that you guys don't have to mess yours up. Okay, and here we are. Um, it's a pretty small little board, as I suspected. It looks like the fake keyboard is actually a separate molded piece of plastic, as usual, and that's certainly part of the attention to detail. Also, I noticed they added metal weights to the bottom, uh, which helps it to be uh, heavy enough to stay in one place uh, on a surface. And let's look at the PCB. Well, there's not much here. Um, I see what appears to be a couple of RAM chips and a flash ROM chip. I suspect there's some sort of system on a chip behind that heat sink, but uh, I'm not sure what kind. Uh, it looks like they left off four capacitors that the original design must have had. And uh, there's also a small button of some kind here that I don't know what does. And uh, two missing pin headers here. I wonder what those are for. Oh, and I also wanted to have a look at the power LED. It does appear that they have two LEDs, so there is one for the floppy drive. But I have not yet observed that light flashing. Overall, I'm really impressed with the build quality of this product, and especially the thought that went into the design of this product. Now, I know it's going to be $139 uh, is the projected price, and a lot of people are going to say that's a little bit expensive for a toy. And, you know, maybe it is, but I don't know. Being that you're getting a fully functional mouse and uh, controller that you can use on your regular computer along with it, <laughs> I don't know, I, hope, I think that helps um, justify the price, uh, you know, maybe just a little bit. I'm also told this is going to go on sale in the USA probably around May 31st, so we still have a ways to wait. But if you're in Europe, you're going to be getting it a lot sooner. I've been told April 8th is when this will be hitting store shelves. I wasn't able to do any particular type of latency testing on this like I did on the previous models, um, but I didn't notice any particular latency when I was playing any of the games. I suspect they're using that more powerful processor that they used in the C64 Maxi, and so they're probably uh, it's probably up to the job, I think. <laughs> anyway, um, that about wraps it up for this episode. Uh, I know I've got a lot of Amiga stuff that both has been coming out and is about to be coming out. And it's actually just maybe a happy coincidence that this product is coming out right in the middle of it. So I'm not trying to um, flood my channel with Amiga videos. It's just ending up being kind of a coincidence. But uh, yeah, I've got several more Amiga related stuff coming out soon. So uh, anyway, <laughs> uh, that's about it. So I'll see you guys next time.